<clears throat> well, good afternoon. Uh, I'm John McLeod from the University of Leeds uh, in the UK, and I have uh, the pleasure of introducing our next keynote speaker, uh, Belen Martin Lucas. On Monday morning at the opening ceremony, uh, Helga importantly reminded us that IACLAUS is a community of exchange. Uh, to be sure, we come together at the conference every three years to exchange ideas and intellectual passions, uh, but we also meet not just as an academic community, but as a transpersonal community too, to launch or refresh friendships, uh, to extend and enjoy hospitality, to forge memorable convivialities, and as I found out last night, to indulge in muchas sidra. <laughs> um, I mean, for me, this understanding of ourselves as a hub of intellectual exchange and also a vital and revitalizing community of friendships is epitomized by Belen. Belen received her PhD here from the University of Oviedo, and she's taught post-colonial literatures and film at the University of Vigo for many years. As a scholar, she's written widely on feminism, globalization, nationalism, and more besides, as captured by her collaborative collections, transnational uh, 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 connections, Asian Canadian women's fiction of the 1990s, and reading multiculturalism, contemporary post colonial literatures, and many more distinguished publish publications, besides, of course. But she's also worked tirelessly over many years to broker new opportunities for international scholarly collaboration in our field at Vigo and elsewhere through the organization of conferences, symposia, and academic exchanges across several continents. This unflagging academic citizenship is both admirable and enviable, and many of us in the room are indebted to Belen's determined commitment to our field, at once intellectually passionate and wisely, generously pragmatic. I am one such indebted person. I first met Belen at the 2007 Aklaus conference in Vancouver, where she swiftly signed me up for a symposium on teaching the post-colonial later uh, that year at the University of Vigo, which I was thrilled to attend. And that was the first of several trips to Galicia, where Belen welcomed me not just into the academic, academic conversation of post-colonial studies here in Spain, but also into her home, where I was lucky enough to, know, to get to know Guio and their two daughters. Such are the principles, as well as the pleasures, of humane, convivial, scholarly ambassadorship. So you'll understand why it's such an honor for me today to introduce Belen's keynote address. This afternoon, Belen will speak on Neoliberal Wars of Terror, a decolonial feminist critique of the war on terror meta-narrative. Please join me in welcoming Belen Martin Lucas. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a very moving introduction. I'm very moved today to be speaking in Oviedo <laughs> and at um, Atlas, which is obviously like you know a major event in in our many meetings. Uh, it is a great honor to be here today among so many many dear friends, many dear friends that I have been you know able to. Uh, to see these past days, and many respected colleagues as well on this very special occasion of reunion for all of us who gathered here 21 years ago. It's amazing to think how fast time flies. <laughs> I wish to express my heartful gratitude to Isabel for opening for me the doors to feminist and post-colonial literature, and especially for providing me with the tools and the support and the encouragement to develop my own feminist pedagogy. Gracias, Isabel. And thank you also to Liamar and to all members of the organizing committee for their kind invitation, and to all the volunteers helping all of us during this conference. Gracias, de verdad. My talk today will offer, for the most part, as the title announces, a feminist decolonial reading of selected literary representations of the so-called war on terror, which is, in my phrasing, a war of terror by women authors. 
But before engaging with the literary text, I will recourse to the performative world of urban fashion to introduce some of my concerns regarding the gendering and racialization processes within hegemonic discourses on the war on terror. In a brief essay entitled Terrorist Chick, Humera Afridi reflects on the quick appropriation of allegedly terrorist looks into the fashion world of post 9-11 New York, extending her discussion from the popular use of the Palestine scarf in the fancy cafes in Soho, to the ironic use of the iconography of terrorism by those who have the luxury to double in the exercise from the safety of Caucasian exteriors. I will have all the quotations here, so I will not say quote unquote, you can just <laughs> follow them. Okay. Consider, for instance, the supposedly joking nature of these hand grenades designed as case wallets or ornaments for women's bags. Would they seem equally cute among the apparel of the urban warrior look designed by Hardy Bletchman for his lauded streetwear brand Maharishi two years ago? I think it's pretty obvious for, sorry, it's, I think it's pretty obvious that the gender, race, and class of the career of such fashion accessories will make a difference in our appreciation of these ornaments. Are these tolerable only among the wealthy in global metropolitan centers? Are they cute and ironic, disgusting, or simply phony? Another example. A group of bearded villains club members were mistaken for ISIS terrorists in Sweden in October 2015, and this gained them cheerful international celebrity. This was not the reaction when only two months later, two Muslim security guards from Orly Airport in Paris were fired on the grounds that they had failed to trim their beards according to the new safety regulations for airport workers uh, passed after the attacks in Paris. In his defense, one of the men insisted he had grown his beard for, pa for fashion, not religion. But his celebrity was not that cheerful. This example shows the clashing readings of the beard depending on the Caucasian or non-Caucasian faces wearing it and proves that Friedi's statement right. Terrorist chic is part of a more general radical chic, also denominated Prada Menhoff in reference to the fashion brand and the German revolutionary group of the 70s, a trend that commodifies revolutionary iconography and contributes to neutralize its effectiveness as potent ideological symbols of resistance and dissent. Cultural appropriation, we have been discussing this before, is a very well-known trait of European colonialism. And as we can notice, it continues to operate full force in the consumerist global empire system. Still, as Afridi points out, unlike other trends, nose piercing and tribal tattoos appropriated from other cultures, Terrorist chick may be the most egregious one cast in the dippets and bean bellets. Sorry, I had forgotten this. Two more examples from the well of fashion may further expose the double standards in the neoliberal metropolitan centers and will help me introduce my critique of the appropriation of feminist discourse for anti-feminist neo-colonial wars. The first one is Stephen Maisel's series of photographs, A State of Emergency, published by Vogue Italy in 2006. This series exploits the narrative of the war on terror as a decor. Some of the white fashion models in super chic and very expensive clothes are portrayed as empowered participants in the apparatuses of discipline and punishment that exert violence in the name of security and protection, embedded as they are in their incongruous, glamorous apparels within the armed forces of the police. In other scenes, in contrast, they are targets and victims of that violence, which is clearly gendered. The allusion to rape and sexual abuse too obvious to be 
ignored. Like here and in these other images. Okay. A second highly controversial case that exploits the image of women, of white women, as victims of terrorism is Peruvian Rodrigo Diaz's more recent fashion photographs in No Olvido Ni Perdono, I Don't Forget, I Don't Forgive, from March 2016, that is last spring. This title appropriates the slogan of the Argentinian resistance to be the less dictatorship not forgetting, not forgiven. And in a typical neoliberal gesture, it individualizes the communal struggle to keep collective memory alive, turning it into a threatening personal revenge. I don't forget, I don't forgive. In this photographic series, inspired by terrorism, according to Diaz himself, the model stands in the midst of devastated buildings wearing worn and torn clothes that even feature ballet halls. As in the case of Maisel Sirius, the mother's female body is highly eroticized despite the context of violence, or perhaps precisely because of the violence. In both series, the aestheticization of terror in the artistic photographs its banalization in the commercial purpose of these images and the instrumentalization of the victim position are very problematic aspects. Moreover, I find especially troublesome the appropriation of the victim position from the racialized and poor female body of the most frequent target of violence to that of an affluent white woman, even if sexually objectified. This raises a multitude of pressing questions regarding the di diverse roles of women in the meta-narrative of the war on terror and the intersection of class, gender, and race privileges of Western white women immersed in a post-feminist neoliberal bubble. Though the rest of my talk will not focus on terrorist chic and urban fashion, but on literary fiction, the issues of appropriation and co-optation will still be relevant. My new project that has just been recently initiated examines literary representations of the war on terror by women authors from diverse cultural and geopolitical contexts, which I read as examples of feminist critical intervention and in different degrees of cultural dissent. Among them, the ones I will use today are these four. I have, the, the list is longer, but I have selected quotes only from these four. Shona Sin Baldwin's We Are Not in Pakistan, from Canada, published in Canada. Merlinda Bobby's The Solemn Lantern Maker, published in Australia. Camila Samshi, Burnt Shadows, published in the UK. And Siobhan Fallon's You Know When the Men Are Gone, published in the US. With this very selection, I intend to impulse the beneficial epistemic frictions advised by Jose Medina against intended or active ignorance and towards epistemic and social justice. I describe my approach as decolonial and feminist in line with Jasmine Sine and Lisa Tyler's, Taylor's vision of quote, a transnational feminist political and pedagogical project located in the public sphere and not only in the classrooms. One where literary and cultural analysis help us learn to read the world through different regimes of truth. I think the meta-narrative of the war on terror constitutes a fertile terrain for the study of competing regimes of truth or perhaps regimes of post-truth, though I want to be very cautious with this term that I dislike very much. But we can converse later if you want about that. Uh, how they are institutionalized through cultural and academic production. As Baden offer reminds us, we need to always be alert and attentive to the dangers of producing or sustaining neo-colonizing knowledges in our critical practice. So I'm using the term meta-narrative following Mona Baker in Translation and Conflict, a narrative account, where she explains that, 
The choice of terror rather than terrorism is significant here and offers a good example of the discursive work required for the successful circulation and adoption of narratives in general and meta-narratives in particular. Terrorism refers to one or more incidents that involve violence with localized, uncontainable impact. Terror, on the other hand, is a state of mind, one that can rapidly spread across boundaries and encompass all in its grid. It may be that a narrative must have this type of temporal and physical breadth, as well as sense of inev inevitability or inescapability to qualify as a meta or master narrative. Terror indexes these feature, features much better than terrorism. Sarah Ahmed's insightful work on the affective politics of fear in the cultural politics of emotion is especially illuminating on how cultural narratives do not merely register the fear of a given group, but in fact produce and amplify the affect of terror. I use meta-narrative to invoke this larger, systematic, ideological work that hegemonic narratives of the war on terror perform. Undoubtedly, 9-11 has become a totemic moment in the imaginary of cultural globalization that is often used to mark the beginning of a new era and the foundational mythical element of a narrative that is, as Baker has argued, aggressively sustained and promoted through a myriad of channels across the entire world, thus rapidly acquiring the status of a super narrative that cuts across geographical and national boundaries and directly impacts the lives of every one of us in every sector of society. In the literary sector, the new category of post 9-11 fiction has been consolidated, particularly in the field of US literature, though transnational and post-colonial perspectives are increasingly gaining attention. These are some references, okay? Most of the studies of post 9-11 fiction have focused on men writers with few references to women authors. A remarkable exception is the edited collection of essays, women's fiction and post 9-11 contexts, whose editors defend the idea that, quote, some of the most interesting contemporary women's writing enable us to understand the violent effects of 9-11, the terrorist attacks on September 11, 2001, the Guantanamo Bay and Abu Ghraib prisons, the London bombings of July 2005, as well as the war in Iraq, Afghanistan, and possibly the Arab Spring, and also America's global drone wars, differently from the way male authors have engaged with it. Like them, I'm interested in analyzing the gendered inflections of the meta-narrative of the war on terror, paying special attention to the effects of violence on the material lives of vulnerable civilians and taking into account the increasing degrees of risk at the intersection of race, ethnic, class, and gender differences. I read these literary texts as critical interventions in public discourse as a form of activism in agreement with Mona Baker's idea that undermining existing patterns of domination cannot be achieved by concrete forms of activism alone, demonstrations, sit-ins, civil disobedience, but must involve a direct challenge to the stories that sustain these patterns. I don't intend to suggest that these authors stand on the same political grounds, the same ideological grounds, or that they share similar narrative strategies. Assuming the risk of losing context-sensitive analysis, which I think is crucial in the analysis of each of the texts, I wish to propose in my very brief overview here that these narratives criticize in different ways hegemonic, racist, and sexist capitalist tenets sustaining militarized globalization. I'm, especially, uh, I'm interested especially in, st in studying the epistemic interaction that they engage with, addressing explicitly, as they all do, 
cultural, racial, class, and gender differences in transcultural encounters taking place in urban spaces. Common aspects that they all address, though to different intensity, are the contextualization of the war on terror within a larger history of imperialism, its primary function as the armed branch of neoliberal globalization, its reliance on an ostensibly urban culture of consumerism, and the appropriation of liberal feminist rhetoric in the justification of the humanitarian crusade. I hope that the selected literary samples that I will now offer you will help illustrate my statements. Merlinda Bobbies is a Filipino-Australian writer currently based in Canberra, and her novel, The Solemn London Maker, published in Australia in 2008 and in the US in 2009, takes us to the megalopolis of Manila, moving back and forth from the misery of the slums to the luxurious hotels for foreign tourists and to the largest shopping center in Asia. The narrative addresses very hard realities like children's prostitution, extreme poverty, and brutal corruption. And it puts these apparently Philippine matters in direct relation, relation sorry, to globalization and to the war on terror. An American tourist suffers collateral damage in the shooting of a Filipino political journalist, and she's given shelter in the head of a 10-year-old boy and his mother, who are themselves traumatized and escaping political violence and police brutality. This interesting reversal of positions situates the affluent American woman in need of help from the third world subalterns, who are in turn accused of abducting her and targeted as terrorists, and thus in need of the American woman's protection. The relationship between these three vulnerable characters is presented throughout the novel as one of mutual solidarity in a context of extreme violence. The novel expose, exposes sorry, the intricate ongoing collaboration of corrupt Philippine and American authorities with deep-seated roots springing from 40 years of American occupation that has been revitalized under the camouflage of the war on terror rhetoric. Quote, the news moves on to the joint exercises of the Philippines and the United States military in their common fight against terrorism. At efficiently stage-managed press conferences, the country's respective presidents affirm current bilateral relations and our long history of friendship. But the camera is fickle. It cuts to a veteran activist asking whether this paves the way for the revival of the US military bases, which were shot in 1992. The new program of cooperation between the Philippines and the US, called Balikatan, is regularly presented in the novel as an act of neo-colonial occupation through the journalist insisting questions to the military officers. Quote, Balikatan means shoulder to shoulder. But are you sure you're, it's about our countries fighting the war on terror together? Isn't it about Washington paving the way to reopen the US bases here? Are you getting nostalgic for the old days? Will your so-called permanent temporary presence in the Philippine territory be more permanent than temporary? How soon before we have stars and stripes, uh, and stripes sorry, flying in Manila's airspace? And later, more explicitly, there is protest against America meddling with Philippine affairs. Besides, this is a civilian matter, or are we seeing the use of neocolonialism? Also, the American colonel in charge of the rescue operation admits this history in conversation with the American consul. While the consul complains, we gave them democracy, an educational system, we still feed them foreign air, and what do we get in return? The colonel's response recognizes the abuses. 40 years, Bettina. We occupied them for 40 years. And before that, we fought them in a war. And much later, we backed the dictator 
who robbed them blind for 20 years. One particular scene of the novel is worth commenting in more detail. It takes place in a luxurious hotel suite where Elvis, a child prostitute, admirer of everything American, as his name says, is being raped in the shower while on the background the television announces the agreement between Washington and Manila. Quote. It's a long quote. The Philippine president commiserates with the American ambassador, emphasizing the friendship between the two countries. She invokes the joint military exercises for an urgent cause, the war against terrorism. The anchor woman asks, is this abduction a terrorist act? Just suck up, that's the deal, okay? Bobby said, this is the boy. You and your team want to rip me off? Come on, don't make me wait, boy. Turn around. I said, turn around, you cheat. The shower is steamed up as if there is a fog. Behind the glass, two bodies struggle. A boy is screaming, fuck you, fuck you. His body flattened on the glass, his hands held up as the man grunts. Yeah, I'm fucking you, I'm fucking you. That's the deal, that's the fucking deal. On TV, again, the face of Kate Burns, the American tourist. The conflation here of the foreign rapist, the raped boy, and the abducted American woman is both powerful and symbolic. It alludes literally to the abuse of minors in an economy of globalized sexual trafficking massively dominated by men, and metonymically to the abuse of the civilians funded by the US war on terror in the Philippines. In the name of the protection and safety of American citizens, a stage on a screen in global media through the images of the injured white woman in the novel. Philippine civilians were forcefully displaced, tortured, and killed under Gloria Macapagal Arroyo's mandate from 2001 to 2010. When, quote, the Philippine government included left-wing political opposition, critical journalists, government critics, and local political opposition as targets of violence by the military and the police, sponsored by the US government. Their common interest in the war on terror was to squash any revolutionary absurd and silence opposing voices such as the journalist shot in the novel. In this context, as one of the local police officers expresses in the novel, safe will always be a pretend word. Salvador Regime denounces that, in effect, I quote, in effect, the selection of legal or political opposition and activists as targets of US-funded counter-terror operations in the Philippines substantially, substantially contributed to the increase in human rights violations after 9-11. This situation is explicitly discussed in the novel through a televised debate where the competing regimes of truth on the war on terror are voiced by a journalist, an academic, and a priest, representing the powers of the media, institutionalized education, and the church, respectively. In Shona Sin Baldwin's collection, We Are Not in Pakistan, the different stories offer kaleidoscopic perspectives on the war on terror that present contrasting reactions in the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks, from the angry racism of accommodated white Americans to the fear of imprisonment and dispossession of anyone suspect of being Muslim. These stories help put the war on terror in a wider perspective that considers the question of why this happened. Interspersed allusions to Pearl Harbor, Hiroshima, Vietnam, and Kuwait again contextualize the current events within the longer history of American wars in foreign territories that Salah Hassan has described as never ending occupations. A repeating pattern from the 1890s occupation of Puerto Rico and the Philippines to the mid 20th century occupation of Germany and Japan to the early 21st century occupation of Afghanistan and Iraq, in every one of these cases, the US presence was ostensibly temporary, aimed at overthrowing an unjust dictatorship, 
yet quickly took the form of a permanent military presence. Like Baldwin, Camila Samshi also offers a larger picture of this global war in the novel Burnt Shadows, tracing back its origins not only to the long history of American occupations, but also to British colonialism. The narrative traces the migration journeys of Hiroko Tanaka and the many wars that she survives. The bombing of Hiroshima, the Indian-Pakistan partition, the Mujahideen anti-Soviet revolution in Afghanistan, and the post 9-11 war on terror in which she loses her only son to Guantanamo, wrongly mistaken for another man. The novel offers a complex and nuanced view of such historical events through Hiroko's relationships to her Indian husband, their Pakistani son, and the Barton family, a former British colonial clan now involved in American neo-colonialism. The burnt shadows in the title are the scars of the war on the flesh of women. Hiroko has shapes like birds on her back from the nuclear bomb dropped by the Americans on Hiroshima in her youth. In the 21st century, her son, Rasam, who's working for a private contractor in Afghanistan, Barton Jr., thinks of the marks of this war on Afghan women's bodies, quote. Everywhere, remnants of the American bombing campaign, craters in the road, indiscriminate as a meteorite shower. Black metal shaped like a jeep in a headstand. He wondered if a burqa clad woman standing near the jeep when it scorched might have a mesh tattooed on her face. In this way, he had been thinking of his mother almost constantly on the road to Kandahar. In Shamsi's novel, um, sorry, in Shamsi's novel, the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki are put in connection with the war on terror radically, that is, at its roots. Critiquing American bombing of Afghanistan, Hiroko addresses Kim Burton, representing the hegemonic voice of the white American liberal woman in the novel, with the following argument. You have to deny people their humanity in order to decimate it. You Americans don't. You just have to put them in a little corner of the big picture. In the big picture of the Second World War, what was 75,000 more Japanese dead? Acceptable, that's what it was. In the big picture of threats to America, what is one Afghan? Expendable. Maybe he's guilty, maybe not. Why risk it? Kim, you're the kindest, most generous woman I know. But right now, I understand for the first time how nations can applaud when their governments drop a second nuclear bomb. And notice the second, there was a first. These narratives, therefore, portray the war on terror, not as a new era suddenly erupting after 9-11-2001, but as the intensification and global expansion of ongoing colonization, staunchly patriarchal and capitalist that stems from centuries ago. Following Jasbir Puar, I read 9-11 in these narratives as, quote, an event in the delusion sense, privileging lines of flight, an assemblage of spatial and temporal intensities, coming together, dispersing, reconverging. The eventedness of September 11 refuses the binary of watershed moment and turning point of radical change, versus intensification of more of the same, tether between its status as a history-making moment and a history-vanishing moment. Sarah Ahmed has argued that the patriotic discourses of love for the nation that followed the 9-11 events stirred a narrative of retaliation that, quote, allowed home to be mobilized as a defense against terror. The trope of the protection of the homeland continues to be dominant in this meta-narrative, as we have seen in the past responses, sorry, in recent responses to terrorism in Europe and in the US. As Bobby's character, Colonel Lane phrases it, 
Harm is that vulnerable place which justifies arsenals, the reason invoked when we go to war. We must protect our home, everyone against our home is evil, there is no other home outside ours. Masculinist heroism related to the protection of the home, family, or nation by strong men has not only not disappeared as an ideal, it has been reinforced despite the incorporation of women to the police and military forces, which demand masculinized women and not feminized men. As Jean Jean de Pedman has pointed out, the events of 9-11 and the consequent war on terror disappeared women as actors and feminists as authorities in international politics. Women were forcibly, forcibly, sorry, forcibly returned to their traditional place in the old war story as victims, markers of national boundaries, and those for whom men and states must fight. Even the increasing numbers of women noticed in state militaries usually operated to confirm stereotypical gender roles or underline anxieties at their apparent bending. Petman's comment uh, signals to the main archetypal constructions of the violent woman in this war as in previous ones, the mother defending her children, the deviant monster, and the masculine woman who is one of the guys. These are recent books on women's participation in the war. Okay? In this meta-narrative of the war on terror, Petman insists, her mas masculinity was privileged based on force and power over or dominance relations. Estates were constructed as bounded masculine actors, though some were feminized through defeat occupation or humiliation. Gender as always marking and representing power relations more generally. This is not to deny the active participation of women in the war and in the international politics governing these decisions. It is about how such actions are given common sense as properly masculine or properly feminine ones. In this respect, it's relevant to remark that the figures of political authority in Merlinda Bobby's novel are women, not only the corrupt president, Gloria Arroyo, but also the American ambassador, who was Christy Kenny, and the consul, Bettina, in the novel, probably Bettina Malone, a spokesperson of the embassy at that time. Or that in Shamsi's Burnt Shadows, it is Kim Burton who denounces the Afghan suspect and gets an innocent man sent to Guantanamo. Another prominent example is the character of Ranin in Siobhan Fallon's short story, Camp Liberty, in the collection You Know When the Men Are Gone, which focuses on American troops deployed in Iraq. Ranin is an Iraqi interpreter who also acts as informer for the American Corps. When Ranin is assigned to David Mogesson's team, he complains, quote, there is a reason we don't have women in the infantry. The guys are going to worry about a woman in the heat of it. It will interfere with our mission, invoking the view of women as weak and vulnerable, as well as distracting to male heteronormative eyes. To this, his superior replies, she chose the job. She knows the danger better than any of us. Ranin is a resourceful professional who knows well that the American troops are not in Iraq on a benevolent humanitarian project. On their first mission together, Ranin accompanies the unit to bring school materials and food to a girl's school, where she converses with the headmistress while the soldiers play soccer with the girls. And she later, sorry, as she later explains to a confounded David, the real objective was not to help the girls, but to get information from the headmistress about a factory of explosive devices to be dismantled. As Rani, ex Rani explains, and it's the third quote, 
No one notices the women in this country, and therefore no one notices how much the women notice. Exceeding her functions as interpreter, Ranin is employed to interrogate women and children and thus find out in a few hours what military intelligence would never find out. This acknowledges the recourse to women by, sorry, the recourse by the Allied forces to women on the ground, despite the official banning of women from ground combat in place till 2013 in the US and 2016 in the UK. For instance, though not officially recognized as combatants, the Lioness teams operating in Iraq and Afghanistan since 2003 had been embedded in combat unit, units to extract information, search women at checkpoints, and more importantly, help promote relation building through their contacts with women and children. Their work advanced a NATO resolution passed in December 2007 to expand the functions of women, soldiers, and police in its operations so that in addition to their basic roles, they could also be communicators with and influencers of the female segment of the host nation, particularly in Muslim, country, Muslim cultures. For the first time since women joined the armed forces, there is a military field based on gender. The NATO then created female engagement teams in 2010, though the US has also used the term cultural support teams to avoid making gender discrimination explicit. In Fallon's story, sorry, in Fallon's story, Ranin feels insulted by Mog's ignorance, she says, of the real mission. He seems to genuinely believe the version from his commander when he gave him school materials for the girls and told him, you are here to help this country, right, Mog? This is also what his men think, though they resent doing what they consider are feminine tasks, though expressed in coarser terms. Quote, I appreciate the humanitarian crap and all, but now that we have a, a woman term, are we going to get tasked with all the pussy missions? Despite their derogatory views, Ranin's gender is, as in the case of the lioness soldiers, an added value. Still, she's kept in a subaltern and feminine position as assistant to the unit. Moreover, given that she's not an American, but an Iraqi woman, nobody cares to investigate her disappearance in a context where the abduction of women and killing of civilians is an everyday matter. The humanitarian crap in the justification of armed intervention is of course one of the aspects most discussed among feminists since 9-11. Since the meta-narrative of the war on terror unashamedly employs the rhetoric of liberal feminism to justify imperial wars. The uses of women for anti-feminist purposes, in words of Pedman, in this meta-narrative has been widely criticized from decolonial feminist perspectives. The discourse of imperialist feminism, the mission of rescuing brown women from barbarous brown men, as theorized by Gajatri Spivak and widely criticized by many authors, among them Lila Abu Luhud and Leila Ahmed, is a true obstacle to end militarized occupation. The debate on this question is obviously too vast to be summarized here in a few minutes, but I wish to offer you one literary example, just as a very small sample of such critique. Baldwin's short story, We Are Not in Pakistan, focuses on the tense relationship between an American teenager, Kathleen, and her Pakistani grandmother, Miriam. Although Kathleen has a very complex and rich ethnic and racial background, she wants to be identified simply as normal, meaning American in her phrase. 
More specifically, she absolutely refuses to be associated to Pakistan because people at the school will think she's Muslim, which she isn't. She is Christian, her whole family is Christian. And she will be consequently ostracized, like the Muslim girl, quote, with dark eyes and a nose like her own, sitting alone in the school cafeteria because she wears a white hijab that screams Muslim so loud people can hear it a mile away. This girl's segregation hints at the violent expulsion of Muslim subjects from the national community. And Kathleen fears this label may stick to her body, in Sarah Ahmed's terminology, if she's seen with a girl. As Sign and Taylor advise, it is important then to consider the impact of Orientalism on the ground as the material consequences of Islamophobic and Orientalist discourses permeate the Western imaginary and affect the embodied and lived reality of Muslims in the West, simultaneously producing and configuring a racial and gendered politics of the nation where Muslims reside as anti-citizens. Kathleen's choice of clothes denotes explicitly the struggle between cultures to signify her body as either properly American or properly Pakistani, according to her grandmother's idea of proper female attire. Quote, Grandma's fault, tank kinis, tank tops, and straps were not allowed, nor were bare, bare midriffs. Hipster jeans were forbidden. A prohibition that she transgresses wearing a Britney Spears tank top and shorts. Her rebellion consists in showing more leg than grandma can handle. The contest over the quantity of flesh a woman may show in public is of course a prominent metonym for the cultural wars of the post 9-11 era, as reflected in the famous cartoon by Malcolm Evans on the bikini versus burqa. Everything covered but her eyes, what a cruel male-dominated culture. Nothing covered but her eyes, what a cruel male-dominated culture. In her refusal to be identified as a Pakistani girl in conversation with her grandmother, Kathleen invokes the image of women in burqa that were ever present in the Western media in those days. Quote, I don't look like a girl in Pakistan, says Kathleen. All of them wear those black things. Burkas? On TV, you mean? CNN loves showing women in burkas. But I didn't see many burkas in Lahore when I was growing up. We were so cosmopolitan then, darling. It's so different now because of the fundies in the rural areas. So parochial they are. You know, just like Americans who haven't traveled. I love this line. <laughs> On the one hand, Kathleen reproduces here the post-feminist premise that the exhibition of the sexually objectified female body is not only liberatory, but also empowering, a premise that appears contrasted to Pakistani women's alleged lack of agency that Kathleen's description of them presupposes. This is a recurrent strategy of self-deception that Western women have been resorting to since colonial times, as Chandra Mohanty exposed in her very influential essay, Under Western Eyes. As Wendy Brown has pointed out, the contrast between the nearly compulsory burying of skin by American teenage girls and compulsory veiling in a few Islamic societies is drawn routinely as absolute lack of choice indeed tyranny over there, an absolute freedom of choice representatively redoubled by near nakedness over here. A discourse that is critically echoed in Baldwin's reference to a speech pronounced by Donald Rumsfeld at Arlington Cemetery about the triumph of freedom over tyranny. Sarah Ahmed's incisive comment that happiness as a form of duty is written in the language of freedom may be applied here to reveal the post-feminist indictment on women to be content in choosing the forms of our own oppression. On the other hand, 
the parallelisms established by Kathleen's grandmother between Afghan fundamentalists and Americans who haven't traveled further emphasizes the continuities in male-dominated cultures exposed in Evans' cartoon and serves as a warning of the real risks for women in the current post-feminist context and its conservative backlash, these are some references, okay, regarding how easily the rights of women are revoked, even in the name of women's liberation. To conclude, I would like to emphasize how in this brief survey of post 9-11 feminist fiction, the war on terror surfaces often as the armed branch of neoliberal capitalism, helping consolidate the global empire system led by the US in violent terms, both economic and military. As one of Baldwin's characters phrases it, this is about economics and power. The rest just covered. The meta-narrative of the war on terror exploits freedom and democracy as fundamental pillars of its civilizing mission. But the actual war of terror has in fact restrained, when not simply canceled, the freedom, the freedom and democratic rights of citizens. It has also appealed to feminist ideals while in fact worsening the conditions of life for most women and increasing gender violence in practically all spheres of women's lives. As Alda Faccio has pointed out, quote, feminists after September 11th were faced with a new and an old situation at the same time. Old because patriarchs had always used women to justify their wars. Think of Helen of Troy. All because in spite of some progress for some women, the gender structures that maintained women's oppression had been kept almost intact. New because September 11th marked in the history of this planet the unequivocal militarization of the process of globalization of extreme capitalism. The colonial feminist analysis of globalization have repeatedly denounced the fierce backlash against women's rights and openly criticized the racism, sexism, and homophobia permeating the meta-narrative of the global war on terror. As in all wars, the bodies of women have become the territory where the clash of cultures is tested with antagonistic cultural codes, such as undressing and covering female bodies, for instance, pulling women in opposite directions. I open my talk with a reference to terrorist chic to expose the blatant racial privileges that it exhibits. In her novel, The Solemn Lantern Maker, Merlinda Bobbis has a character with for an antidote against unscrupulous self-interest a drug for decency. In the current necropolitical scenario, this wish seems even more utopic. On March 22nd, as I was trying to write an optimistic concluding paragraph for this lecture, because as uh, it was commented before, I don't want a depressed audience, I want an anchor audience, and I want to mobilize that anger. I was trying to write this conclusion, okay? And a new terrorist attack in London caused six deaths. And we had one more chance to witness the media and political apparatus of this meta-narrative reiterating the spectacle of mourning for the grievable lives of citizens and tourists. Okay, I have more slides. On the same day, the following news was published in the New Yorker. American letter strikes kill over 30 civilians in Syria. The day after the London attack, when all the press was all about the London attack, this other one, over 200 civilian deaths reported in Iraq. As numerous reports indicate, the number of civilians killed in Syria and Iraq skyrocketed in March under Trump, proving, in words of Glenn Greenwald, 
that Trump's war on terror has quickly become as barbaric and savage as he promised. Notice barbaric and savage okay, in this civilizational crusade. A war of terror, indeed. None of these deaths received the media attention or the global grieving that the London attack did. In the face of such blatant despisal for the lives of those who suffered the consequences of our old and new colonialisms, the direct challenge to the hegemonic narrative of the war on terror continues to be an urgent task. I hope I've been able to convey through my analysis of the selected literary text their common defense of an ethics of accountability and solidarity, or at least to have a provoked some epistemic friction. And since I opened my, with a reference to the fashion world, I'm closing, coming back to it, with an image of a designer and comedian, Frida de Guise, t-shirt protest in Sydney, an ironic response with a touch of terrorist cheek. I'm a fashion threat, not a terror threat. Thank you very much for... <laughs> Well, and th thank you for a, a characteristically rich and wide-angled engagement with that wealth of material. I mean, you remind us um, not just of the necessity uh, of putting under pressure narrative uh, writing, but also of the absolute necessity of critical interrogative reading, especially mm -hmm. to a decolonial feminist standpoint. Um, I suspect you will have more than one question in the time that's remaining for this panel. So can I invite some responses or questions from the audience? Yeah. Alberto? Alberto? I'll be the one to break the ice. Thank you so much. A very thought provoking, very passionate and, uh, and very inspiring, if, if slightly depressing, but also, you know, anger can make us respond to things uh, um, as well. So my question, without wanting to give um, this person much, uh, much more pandering or kind of um, um, advertising, I'm thinking, you know, of the of the discourse underpinning the war on terror, things like Samuel Huntington's The Clash of Civilizations, and this is the person I didn't want to give too much uh, mm -hmm. advertising to. <laughs> um, and I'm thinking of the work of the very of the late and very much missed Edward Said, who said that the relationship between Islam and the West is one of interdependence mm -hmm. rather than clash through the centuries. How do you think that some of these writers like Sh Shamshi and Baldwin, how do they tread the line between you know having to contest Islamism and also Orientalism? Do they find a way of of, of finding a feminist line that uh, mm -hmm. uh, that kind of fights the two at the same time? I will drink and I will answer. <laughs> Okay, I see this, this is the old, old question and, you know, the, the problem that all feminist writers have um, of being accused of being traitors to their culture and having to respond, you know, to find the balance between exposing patriarchy and sexism within their culture and, and outside and also defending that their communities, and they are part of a community. And this is the struggle of every feminist. It's not particular to you know, the moment now, the radicalized division between, uh, you know, with, with the context of Islamophobia. It has happened before. Think of Alice Walker being, you know, trust by, for, uh, you know, representing all the stereotypes that white people want to see, or any of the Latina, uh, Chicana authors, you know, again being criticized, Irish women authors being attacked, you know, from inside because they are, you know, criticizing their societies. But every feminist is a traitor to patriarchal culture. <laughs> That's what feminism is about. We don't want the tradition to continue, right? So it is in this context when you have racism 
Um, I think, you know, Islamophobia is very, is, is, is a form of racism, very much, right? Um, attacking your community and, and you want to criticize, you know, that attack, and, but you also need to make, you know, a defense of a community that's, that you are not defending the specific patriarchal values of that community as well. So this is always there the dilemma the, of how to approach this question without falling into the trap of giving more weapons to the enemy, right? To use, again, the discourse of the war. But it has, has always happened. It's always very difficult. I think they do a brilliant work. They do a brilliant work in being very nuanced in contextualizing, and, and I said, I'm, I'm very aware that I cannot provide the context, the specific context for each of the texts in, you know, in just 50 minutes, but I think it is crucial to read, you know, to see the historical contextualization for the events in each of the cases and how they locate, you know, the location of the speaking subject <laughs> theory, it's crucial, it's, they are situated. They are, situ these are situated critiques and criticisms. They are not observing from outside and just, you know, denouncing this or that. They are very much implicated within the communities that they are uh, trying to represent or that they are just fictionalizing about in their, in their works. But I think that they are doing it uh, with you know, very carefully and being aware that they are going to be used in that way as well, and I think that they do a brilliant work. Have I responded, Alberto? Thank you. Dom, at the back there. Thanks for really, oh, loud, sorry. Uh, thanks for a really interesting uh, lecture and presentation. You put up a really interesting a uh, quotation from uh, Mona Baker, I think, and uh, mm. she said that, uh, you know, these moments of civil unrest um, uh, and kind of protest marches uh, were all well and good, but the, the, the larger narrative needs to be uh, kind of communicated or, uh, you know, we need a different kind of narrative and you're obviously contributing to the, the mm -hmm. construction of that. Um, I wonder if that's actually the wrong way round there. I wonder if maybe... Um, those moments of, of actual protest when we see urban space being occupied are actually mm -hmm. the symptoms of, of a much, like, you know, the tip of the iceberg of, of much deeper narratives of, you know, it takes a lot for people to go out and, and protest and actually these narratives are there. Mm -hmm. I guess my, act, my very quite specific question is what role you think, given that you've talked about four novels today, what role... Uh, in t if we're thinking about creating a narrative that mobilizes protest, how, what role does literature and particularly the novel still have in creating that narrative in the age of the internet and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, post truth and so on? So yeah, forth. I know. <laughs> what do novels do at a time when people don't read novels? <laughs> well, I think people do read novels as well. And these, there are all kinds of different uh, readerships and, and, and audiences and there are messages that go through internet or face, you know, Facebook or you know, um, virtual media very fast, very quick. But there are other forms of communication <laughs> that are still there as well that appeal to other audiences as well that maybe you know, are not just restricted to one form of communication. I do think that literature, I have always believed in the pedagogical value of literature. That's why I have dedicated my professional life to it <laughs> and all my life as a reader as well. And I think that uh, we can still use this, you know, form of protest and activism. What I don't, you know, that's why I'm vindicating uh, this writing as activism uh, instead of, uh, you know, the kind of literature that is um, marketed and promoted as yes entertainment pure entertainment with no you know no need to engage 
in with ideological issues, apparently, supposedly. Okay, I'm very critical of that idea, and I have also worked on that. <laughs> but I think that literature is has always been has always been there. It can be literature ha takes many different forms. Okay, I'm using novels here, but we were yesterday, uh, last night, moved and. Uh, by you know the, the the performance that we were witnessing, and it was a brilliant form of communicating as well. I think the novel still has some space, and that we need to to pay attention to the novels that do not get circulated widely, right? Precisely because maybe those are the ones that are not interesting to the corporations that are ruling <laughs> the you know the literary market as well. On the other hand, we also have the fetish, you know, we, we have been discussing in different panels, literature about terrorism, about jihadists, about, you know, oppressed Muslim women, etc., etc. This is also, you know, obviously a source of income. And that's why I had a quote but from Baden Offer, though this is obviously a, a concern for most of us, that is how not to replicate how not to fall into this, you know, push there to, again, use these materials to our benefits, right? And, and how to do that. I, I don't have an answer to say how far the novel can, you know, influence people nowadays, because obviously it's just a tiny portion that is there, but it's there. And since people read, some people read novels, I think we could use, you know, that even if it's just a small number of people, we can do that. But I think they do affect more this wider meta-narrative, the, the discourse. I think if you think about the issues that you learn through the reading this literature, yes, you know, you get knowledge of other things that you maybe you haven't considered, and you will at least not replicate the discourse, right? Or maybe get angry when you see the celebration, well, not celebration, but the commemorations of dead people in the attacks, and, and maybe you can think of all those other ones that they are telling you are dying as well, right? So it's small portion, but it's an important portion as well. And uh, we've only got time for one more question, I'm afraid, but uh, Amy, do you want to mm. take the microphone? Thank you very much. Th thank you for that excellent, really, really engaging talk. Um, I, talking about small portions, that kind of relates to my question, which is also asking you about form, but um, I noticed that in the paper you're not just talking about novels, but there's um, a couple of short story collections mm -hmm. are very important to you. And even Burnt Shadows, which, although it is a novel, is kind of interestingly structured, not quite like a short story cycle, but certainly seems to be influenced by that. Um, what is it about sort of short story collections, the short story form, or even st short story cycles? Do, do you find engaging for these bigger sort of meta-narrative geopolitical issues? Because it does, the poetry and short stories do seem to enjoy grappling with, what, at the moment, with what's normally been associated with the novel. Okay, I wrote a thesis on the short story cycle, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, supervised by Isabel here. So, like, how, 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 much, how much time do I have for this? <laughs> a couple of hours. I do think it is a, you know, in my PhD thesis defended like ages and ages ago. <laughs> I defended the idea that the short story cycle is a political form that feminist writers uh, can use because of the flexibility that it gives. Like I mentioned that Shona Simbaldin's collection, We Are Not in Pakistan, I, I use the term kaleidoscopic perspective. And I think uh, the other one is also a short story cycle, okay? The one by Shibon Fallon. All these stories are interlinked. They are all soldiers living, uh, you know, that, that have to, are deployed at Zion, you see the, lives of the families staying in Fort Texas, I think it is, and, and the soldiers, etc. So it is a wonderful form that provides space to focus on different perspectives and then contrast them. And you can have opposite reactions and opposite 
ideological positions represented in the same kind of larger narrative, but they are also, you know, like they work as independent texts as well. So you can have the same event presenting from very different perspectives, but you don't need to be, you know, so carefully entangling all the elements as in a you know, more formal novel. Although, you know, what is a novel? That is another big question. But thank you very much for the comment because, you know, I like the, the form of the short story cycle. Why? Have I responded? You won't, yes. <laughs> Balan, your keynote marks the midpoint of our conference this week, but I think yes. it will be remembered as something of a high point yeah. in the conference um, as well. Uh, you said you wanted to leave us angry in the best sense and, and mobilized, <laughs> but I suspect. Energy um, at least. Energized. And I suspect as well you have left us inspired. Uh, on behalf of your audience, can I thank you very much indeed for a fantastic, rich, generous, and in the best sense, challenging presentation this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.